So now we're going to do part two of this video. So what we've gone through is phases of matter, solids, liquids, and gases, but understanding it in terms of what the particles are doing. And again, you can do, go through these videos while you're going through the slides on your own. The videos, of course, you can't really advance, but the slides you can. All right, so matter is traditionally broken up into two major subclasses. There's pure substances and mixtures. All right, and so let's talk about each of those and then we'll get to the subparts. So a pure substance has a definite composition. It's one thing and has a unique set of properties and it uh, cannot be separated by a physical change. And a mixture is just more than one thing in the same container. So another way of saying it is a mixture uh, is more than one thing in the same container and each thing in that container behaves, keeps its own characteristics, where a pure substance has one set of characteristics. Interestingly, you can separate mixtures by taking advantage of the differences in the properties. So for example, if I had a mixture of water and sand, right? Um, sand doesn't dissolve in water. You can tell it's a mixture. I can separate it by pouring off the water. You've separated mixtures anytime you've made pasta, right? You have a mixture of noodles and water. You pour it through a strainer, water goes through the holes, the noodles do not, right? All right, so mixtures are traditionally, if we back up to the flowchart, whoops, went too far. Mixtures are broken up into homogeneous and heterogeneous. So one thing that's very helpful in the sciences is learning prefixes and words. So hetero is a prefix that means different, right, heterogeneous. Homo is a prefix that means same. So a heterogeneous mixture just means it's not evenly mixed. So this would be a heterogeneous mixture. The mixture of water and sand that I was talking about would be a heterogeneous mixture. Noodles and water, all right? Uh, a homogeneous mixture is the, the properties are evenly distributed. It doesn't really look like it's a mixture. Like tap water, for example, has dissolved minerals, dissolved ions. We'll do a whole unit on water. Um, that is a mixture. Air is a mixture. All right. Homogeneous means it's evenly mixed. Another good example, let's say I took um, some ice cream and some chocolate and made an ice cream sundae. If I close my eyes and stuck the spoon in five different places and took samples out, depending on where I took the sample, I, might, I would get different compositions. I might get pure ice cream in one. I might get pure chocolate in another. I might get 50-50, 60-40. If I took the ice cream and chocolate, so that would be heterogeneous. If I took the ice cream and chocolate and put it in a blender and made it into a milkshake, no matter where I take a spoon, I'm going to get the same percentage of ice cream and chocolate. So that would be a homogeneous or homogeneous mixture. In fact, in the old days when you would buy milk, it would say homogenized milk because milk tends to separate. And they went through a process to make it so it doesn't do that. So that's what mixtures are. Now, um, I want to make sure you know the difference between pure, uh, mixtures are not pure substances. So pure substances are one thing. And they also come in two flavors. There are elements and compounds. So let's talk about each one of these. All right, elements are the fundamental substances. So they, are, they cannot be broken down into simpler substances. Everything is made from elements. And we'll say it now, the smallest piece of an element is an atom. And we'll talk about that in more detail actually in the next set of slides. Okay, not in the next video on this set of slides, but in the next set of slides. Right now, the atoms can all be found on the periodic table. And it's a good idea. I would, while you're taking this class, print a periodic table or have one available to you. I have one on the wall in my house. I literally have like six of them because all the cool kids have periodic tables on the walls of their house. Now, we're going to spend a lot of time with this as we progress through the, actually the next set of slides. We're going to do a really good look at this. But if you look at it, it's a weird way to arrange it, but it's very important that it is arranged this way. And there's all these symbols and numbers and what do they all mean? And we're going to go through all of that later on. Um, in your textbook, there is an alphabetical list of all the elements. I forget where it is, but I'll find it for you uh, when we get to another place. But there's an alphabetical list, but there's a periodic table on the inside back cover of your textbook. And there's somewhere in the textbook, there's an alphabetical list of all the elements. Now, a couple things about the elements. First of all, if you want to know if something is an element, where do you look? 
If it's on the periodic table, it's an element. If it's not on the periodic table, it's not an element. It's literally that simple. By the way, there's a website called Web Elements, and if you click on each any element, it'll tell you all sorts of useless information about them. Some other things about the symbols. All the symbols have one capital letter, right? Um, if there's more than one letter, the other ones are not capitalized. That's very important because punctuation is huge. So CO, big C, little o, is an element. Cobalt, it's a metal. Big C, big O, is not an element. It's a compound, right? And like I said, all the elements are on the periodic table. You'll also notice that some of the elements, the symbols make sense. So Li is lithium. C is carbon. O is oxygen. Some of them don't seem to make sense. Potassium is K. Sodium is Na. The reason, guess what, sports fans, English is not the only language. Most of them even come from the Latin root. Iron is from ferrium. Lead is from plumbium. You ever wonder why the word plumbing has a B in it? The reason is it came from the word, the Latin word for lead, which is plumbium, because the Romans invented plumbing and they used lead pipes. There's your fun fact for the day. All right. Now, a compound is similar to a mixture in that it's made from more than one thing, but it has one set of properties. So a compound is one thing made from more than one thing. An element is one thing made from one thing. And a mixture is more than one thing in the same container. Compound is a pure substance. A mixture is not. Now, compounds are represented by formulas, and we're not going to... I'll show you later how to come up with formulas, but I'm going to show you now how to read them. It'll have the symbol for the elements, and it'll have a subscript. The subscript goes with whatever immediately precedes it. So that means that there's two hydrogens. We do not write a one. So ones are implied. If there's no number written, it's assumed to be a one. So this means two hydrogens, one oxygen. All right? So just to summarize, element... Right is the simplest type of sub pure substance made from one thing. A compound is a pure substance made from more than one element. Atom is the smallest piece of a particle. So this is that same idea. All right, this is the whole thing in one slide, although I think this is a little bit complicated. So we talked about solids, liquids, and gases, and then mixtures and pure substances. All right. All right. Go through, I'm going to go through properties because uh, we'll talk about this. So we talked about, these are a lot of definitions. Physical properties are the properties of a substance that you can kind of figure out just by looking at it or by sensing things. So it's just a description. It's a physical description. And chemical properties are behavior with other substances. So if you want to know if something is a physical or a chemical property, go, does it depend on other things? And if the answer is yes, it's a chemical property. Physical properties are things like the color, the shape, the odor, um, the, the state at room temperature, the melting point, the boiling point, the density. Chemical properties, you can just say it's reactivity with fill in the blank. So does it react with oxygen? What does it do when it reacts with oxygen? If it doesn't react with oxygen, that would still be a chemical property. You can think of it if you want to use people as an analogy. Your physical properties would be your height, your weight, your hair color, your eye color, things like that. Your chemical properties would be your personality. Um, these are just some examples. This is another slide that talks about it. Okay. Uh, I want to spend a moment talking about an interesting physical property. A density is a physical property. It's the mass per unit volume, mathematically, for those of you who are math people, D equals M over V. It's kind of crowdedness. So things that are very, very have high densities, um, they are a lot of stuff, right? The mass is high, but the volume is low. A lot of stuff in a small amount of space. So solids have high densities. Um, things that are very diffuse, not dense, would be like gases. Particles are very far apart. They're going to be a very small number. So to put it in perspective, solids have densities of 2, 3, 5, 10. Like gold has a density of 12. Okay, Air, a density of 0 0.001. Um, an interesting application of density is called Archimedes' principle. So when a substance is placed in a liquid, it will displace a volume equal to its own volume. That's Archimedes' principle. What does that mean? It means when you get in the bathtub, the water level goes up, and it goes up by your volume. Um, now, what does that mean? Well, if the substance, and it doesn't have to be put in a liquid, it could be put in a gas. 
Uh, if the substance doing the displacing weighs less than what it displaced, it will float. So things will float in water, not if they're lighter than water, if they're less dense than water. Things will float in air, not if they're lighter than air, but if they're less dense than air. It's a, a little bit different, right? Because it's pushing away. If you put something in water, it pushes away water. If it pushes, if the weight of what it's of the water is that it pushes away is more than the weight of the thing, it'll float. And this is why, if you think about why does a ship float? They're made of iron. Iron is very dense. And it's because the weight of the ship is less than the weight of the water that it pushes away. The ship is very, very heavy. They weigh tons. But the ship actually has a lower density. So just to put it in perspective, water has a density of one gram per milliliter. Iron has a density of almost eight grams per milliliter. So if you took a piece of iron and dropped it in water, it would sink like a stone. How do iron ships float? Because they have a big air bubble in them, right? Right there at the bottom has chambers just full of air. Air has a density a thousand times almost less than water. So overall, the density of the ship is actually lower than the water. The material it's made of is much heavier, but it's got a big air bubble in it. There's your fun fact for the day. All right, the last little bit are changes that matter undergoes. There's physical and chemical changes. Physical change is a change without changing the identity. So phase changes, for example. All right. A chemical change, you make new stuff. And that's really the best way to look at it, is in a chemical change, new substances are formed. So if you want to think in terms of, is it a physical or a chemical change, just ask yourself, did I make new stuff? If the answer is yes, then it's a chemical change. If the answer is no, it's physical. And these, this is evidence, but you know, heat's not always the case, but a color change, sound, that's a smell changes. And then one last thing is what's called the law of conservation of matter. And what this says is matter cannot be created or destroyed, but it can change form. And this was proven by Lavoisier when he did reactions in sealed containers. So in a chemical change, we make new stuff. But by the law of conservation of matter, says, well, where did the new stuff come from? It came from the old stuff. So really what's happening is the particles are rearranging. So you're not destroying the particles, you're just rearranging. So for example, if we take hydrogen and oxygen to make water, and we'll look at equations later, but if you look at here's hydrogen, and here's oxygen, and here's water. But if you count, there's still two red balls and still four gray balls, right? So yes, we've made new stuff, but we did it by rearranging. All right, so this is the takeaway from these slides. You should understand the particulate nature of matter. We'll describe the phases of matter, not only solids, liquids, and gases, but in terms of kinetic theory and answer why can a liquid change its shape and a solid cannot, for example. Talk about the types of matter, meaning um, mixtures, pure substances, elements, compounds, mixtures, and then physical and chemical properties, physical and chemical changes, and the law of conservation of matter. Right. At this point, between the, these two sets of slides, you should be able to do homework number one, which is the next thing in this module. And you guys know how to reach me if you have questions.